right, so we're going to introduce these fabulous people to you guys. Um, welcome. You've found us. I'm so happy you're here. We're talking about selling to the C-suite. We're talking especially during a recession. This is important stuff. So let's jump in. Let me tell you first a little bit about what, what you found and who we are, and then we're going to introduce and get rolling. So you found one of our monthly sales shots. This is a special double shot, which means we'll be here together for an hour. Typically, they are tip-rich 30-minute sessions. We alternate between rep-level topics and management-level topics. Everyone's going to benefit from this one. You can find the next three at factor8.com forward slash shots. Great. Okay, here we go. We're going to do introductions in this order. I'm going to let these wonderful people introduce themselves so that I don't mess it up. Regina and Celine, then Steve and Raleigh, and I'm going to stop share so we can see your fabulous faces. Tell us who you are, what you do, and your perspective that you're helping with today, please. Regina, you're up first. Hi, everyone. I'm Regina Manfredi. I am the Executive Vice President at Crayon Group and the General Manager for Crayon US. I'm excited to be here with you because everyone who's here in a sales capacity, um, that's how I was raised. And so it's exciting to be part of this conversation and discussion because hopefully it will bring something forward to each of you. Crayon is an IT services company that helps customers with cost optimization and their transition into the cloud and modernizing in the cloud. So that's the perspective and background that I bring to the table and the discussion today. So thank you for having me, Lauren. Oh, it's such a pleasure. You always bring something smart to a conversation. I love how you say you were raised in sales. So <laughs> she's out there, she's out there winning deals, folks, and she's going to have some great ideas for us. Celine. Hi, folks. Um, thanks for having me today. So Celine Mara, obviously you can see my my name up in lights. I am the CRO for Hotjar. So I join you today, as I said, from Dublin, Ireland. Um unusual actually for me to do events with people in the Americas. Most of the events that I do are MIA based. So it's great to great to be online. Um, you might have seen from my profile, if you did any, any research before you came on, that I joined Hotjar earlier this year to lead their sales success and support organization. So it's a pretty broad spectrum of a role. Um, if you're not familiar with Hotjar, we do kind of a UX behavioral analytics tool. So uh, we work with organizations pretty much across all industries and segments, as long as they have an online presence. So prior to Hotjar, I've worked with organizations like Zendesk and New Relic, Sage. Some of them are, are pretty well-known um, logos, predominantly leading revenue organizations. So much like Regina, I grew up in sales. It's been what I did and what I am. It's just part of who I am. And I think today I'll join really to give a perspective of a sales leader. So what does a sales leadership role look like through change? Thank you so much for that. By the way, my marketing director, Amy, raves about Hotjar. So that was an essential purchase. We are very happy customers. All right, Steve. Yes, uh, good afternoon or morning, wherever you're at. Uh, my name is Steve Babick. I'm the CFO, Chief Financial Officer for HSI. Um, my background um, has been in SaaS and software sales my entire career around technology. So I've also been raised through sales organizations. I will tell you that a CFO, as from a perspective, think of CFOs as really being the central intelligence agency of an organization. We focus on the KPIs, whether those are operational or financial. We we definitely focus on pipelines and funnel management and where things are standing there from a leading indicator. Um, but a CFO is always about those indicators, right? And so as we think about sales and sales organizations and how to uh, best um, ensure that your initiative is funded and, and ultimately uh, you can sell it. Oftentimes having the CFO or the finance organization on your side is as an ally or as an internal um, champion of what you're trying to do is a good tack for sales folks. Um, so my perspective is going to be from a finance and and uh, ultimately guiding the ship, if you will, uh, from that standpoint. I'm also a mayor in my city. So I will tell you that from a um, from a if you're selling to government to, governmental organizations, um, you know, I can bring some perspective there and some guidelines. I would I would strongly suggest that as you're thinking about selling to municipalities and organizations like school districts and local community um, uh, governance, whether that be school boards and, and um, cities or states, counties and the like, um, that uh, buy boards and um, uh, mutual uh, aid agreements are oftentimes the way to do that. Thank you so much. Oh, that's fat. I already have questions. This is good. I this is going to be great perspective. 
right? Because we all want the CFO on our side. We're going to ask for your advice and Raleigh's about how to make that happen. Raleigh, bring us home. Perfect. Hey, I'm Raleigh Garcia. Raleigh is in North Carolina. Feel free to look at me on LinkedIn. The thing is in the chat. So my experience is really interesting. I've been 360 degrees around this experience. I've been a CFO. I've been a chief administrative officer. I was a chief revenue officer for a software and sales services company. And most recently, I led U.S. marketing for Sage Software, which is a major global SaaS company now. And so I've I've been marketed to as a CFO. I've gone through the buying process as a CFO. I've bought it. I've implemented it. And then I turned around and, and then I've marketed and sold to it. And the perspective that I want to bring you is like a 360 degree view on who your potential customer is and what you should be thinking about. The way that I got to know Factor A, just so everybody knows why I'm here, because I am looking for my next role right now is that I had brought Factor 8 in to help me fix our BDR organization and spent a lot of time working with Ted at Factor 8 to, to really unleash what was happening there and build a go-to-market that allowed us to provide huge amounts of leads that were super qualified to our, that are for the CFO office. That's who we sold to at Sage. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, I'm a little intimidated by the people I'm on the panel with because they're superstars. But let's get this going. Let's kick it off and start teaching some people and asking some really deep questions. You and me both, Raleigh. You and me both. This, this is a superstar panel. All right. So we're going to jump right in. Um, one of the reasons we're doing this right now, folks, is that we know the sea levels getting involved in deals, especially during this. You know, the R word, experts are in and out, right? Are we in a session, recession, right? If, when. I want to know your take. A quick raise of hands, right? Yep. It's recession selling right now. If like, raise your hand if you agree. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we're in a recession. I feel it. It's everywhere. Ah, we disagree. So I want to hear from Celine and Steve first. Why, why not? I'm happy to kind of lead in on that. You know, I think ultimately there are probably segments of the economy that are in a recession. Um, there are certain segments of our country that are probably in a recession and, and certainly seg certainly uh, on a global basis. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm in Texas, so uh, I will tell you that our Texas economy is hot. Um, and generally, as you think about what HSI sells um, into the market space, being compliance driven, um, we are we are we actually uh, find ourselves being somewhat res um, resistant to um, to recession. So um, I think the market is a hot market. There's a lot happening. Um, if you're in a uh, in a California, in New York, or or certainly in Oregon, uh, you might have a different perspective um, from a recession or a non-recession. But things are growing and hot in Texas. I'll tell you. Well, that's good to hear. And it sounds like a politically correct answer to ah. me. Uh, let's hear the other side of the house. Virginia, you went up fast and strong, right? Like, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't care what the politicians say. I'm feeling it. Tell us about that. Well, I think we're seeing some of the buying behaviors shift um, within our customers. And if you look at and think about top priorities in the C-suite today, one of the, the buzzwords that you're hearing more and more frequently is optimization, cost optimization. And so the conversations and discussions that we're having with not just IT leaders, but CFOs is how can you help me reduce my OPEX? I need to cut costs, need to cut capital expenditures as much as humanly possible, because I think they're taking a proactive approach to what they anticipate will be a recession. So they're already acting as if they're in it, um, is, has been my experience and what the team has shared with us. Um, and quite frankly, myself am looking at the PL. How can we reduce OPEX? How can we manage this more tightly? How can we do, I mean, you've even heard Satya Nadella at Microsoft say, we need to do more with less. And so those are big signals and messages to the market and the market is reacting and responding as if we're already in it. So um, yes, I agree with Steve that Texas is hot. I'm right here with you in Dallas, Steve. So I, I don't disagree there, but the buying behavior is shifting. And Celine, do you see the same? Yeah, I mean, I I kind of so I I agree with Steve. I don't uh, I don't necessarily. Um, I I think we have we as humans have a tendency to talk ourselves into things. So I I tend to approach things <clears throat> differently, and that's not taking away from what Regina said. I think she's absolutely right. The buyer behaviors have shifted, but 
you know, what we saw during the pandemic, we were very quickly able to shift a focus to industries that were profiting from the pandemic. So we shifted into the likes of um, fintech, high tech, health tech, e-commerce, retail, e-tail. It was very quick for us to be able to do that. And I think the same rules apply when the when, what's happening is there's an economic shift and these economic shifts happen all of the time. I mean, I remember a time in Ireland when the construction sector went down under. Right. They're booming now. Travel and tourism is booming. So I think what is on us as sales leaders is to identify the industries that now benefit from the current economic climate um, and really kind of tailor and focus our approach with them. So I don't really focus on, I think the ideal of a recession gives people the opportunity to, um, to back out. Let's not back out. We actually have to lean in. Um, and so all we have to do really is be clever about where we pivot our organizations to focus <clears throat> on. That, that's kind of my view. I, I like what Celine's saying. And what I don't want to ever see is someone coming to me and saying, hey, I need quota relief because we might be going to a recession. And nobody wants to see that. Look, we're all, we're adults, we're professionals. That's why we're in the roles that we're in. And so if you're really great at your role, then you're not worried about a recession because you can look on one website, it'll say you are, and another one that says you're not. Your job is to figure out who was buying, how you sell them, and how do you close your sales, your sale. And that's really what, what we need to focus on. If you're worried about the economy and trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to get my number lowered so that I can hit my goals, then you have the wrong focus should be focused on what do I need to do? Who do I need to approach? How can I fix what's broken? How do yeah. I move, work really closely with marketing to make sure that that our buyers, we're talking in my business is B2B, big, huge buying parties. How do I figure out how to address them to move it faster down the pipeline so I can get deals closed? Don't use it as an excuse. I agree, Celine. Mm -hmm. So nobody's given quota relief internally. No. Look at that. Okay. Ooh. Sorry, participants. You were hoping for something else. Don't share this with your boss now. All right. So, so during times that are tougher in sales, right? Regina, you went down this road. You're already looking at how can you minimize expenses? So do you find that you're getting involved in more deals, right? When your company is looking to buy, you're being pulled in, right? Is that Absolutely. true across the board? Anybody not getting involved in deals still? All right. Okay, it's happening across the board. Good. So let me ask you this. How do you decide which deals you're getting involved in, right? When can our participants, our listeners know, oh, C-Suite's going to get involved here? Celine, let's go to you first here. Yeah, I think as a, well, if, if I if I take my standing as a sales leader, so my participation in a deal is really to get the deal moving, right? So I'm joining the call with Steve because Steve doesn't want to talk to us anymore. He's fed up listening to us. And I have a couple of different ways of weighting what I'd get involved in and what I wouldn't. One is the, you know, very um, typically the size of the deal in terms of revenue size. The other would be where you would maybe get involved in a smaller deal, but it has high potential. So it's a high potential strategic partnership or, or, or what that would look like. And I, I think the, the, the reason why I, I set the weightings is actually more for the customer or prospect than it is for our side because what you find quite a lot is you get this shift of weighting of power so what you don't want is to be working with a, a potential customer or an actual customer where there's two of them sat on that side and there's 12 of us sat on our side and it becomes yeah. very intimidating and, and it just shifts the power dynamic and you never want to do that you want to kind of maintain as level set a, a power dynamic right I, I always see it if 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 I'm in that meeting, I need to um, contribute positively to that meeting. Otherwise, I shouldn't be there. If me being there shifts a, a power dynamic or um, it, it shifts the priorities away from what we're trying to achieve, then I won't sit in on it. But yeah, so I, I, I tend to kind of make judgment calls based on based on that. Do you find, so, so listen, we're going to talk about both sides of this. Just, this is the fun of this panel, right? Because we have CROs and CFOs. So this is when Celine's getting involved to help close a deal, right? And you're picking the ones with high potential, high dollars. And when we've got C-level on the other side, so exactly. that it's feeling weighted correctly. Do, do you wait for your team to yeah. come to you? Or do you look at the pipeline and say, I'm coming in on these deals. Does this work? 
it's a little bit of both, if I'm honest. So what we what what I'll often find is you'll have a set of AEs. Probably it tends to be a particular set. Not everybody. Pretend, it might be a I don't know whether it's an intimidation thing or or whatnot. But um, you you tend to have a few that will naturally openly come to you, and then you have another subset where you know we obviously run through forecast cadences every week, so we're looking at the the opportunities that are running, how well they're running, where the challenges are, if they're sticking points, if they need support, what does that support look like? More so at a at a at a, a total organizational level as opposed to just me. And at that point, we'll decide whether or not it would um, support it for for somebody like me coming in. And you tend to see it in the much bigger organizations where the procurement processes are more complex. They'll want to see executive sponsorship on deals so that they understand they have a direct point of contact as well in the business. But that's more where there's a significant financial outlay, I think, on the on the deal. Yeah, I mean, that makes per perfect sense. So I'd like to hear the other side of it. Now, when your company's looking at purchasing, how do we decide which deals you get involved in? So, Steve, let's go to you first. Yeah, ultimately, um, you know, as CFO, I'm going to get pulled into things that are not budgeted, right? Um, but they might be strategic. And so we're going to have to think through um, uh, how that uh, solution, if it's a software solution, if it's a technology solution, how it helps us to be more effective as an organization, um, how it helps us to potentially broaden some of our um, channels, uh, selling channels, um, uh, and how it ultimately brings more information to the table. So, um, my involvement on the procurement side is going to be, is it budgeted or not? Is it, does it help us to uh, manage our risk? Uh, and is it ROI based? Got it. Raleigh, anything different on your side? It, I would add to that, that it's going to be sort of an internal experience. What I want to know is, okay, so why are we buying this? Is it going to replace something else? Why, why are you making this decision? Are you maximizing what we are already utilizing in the process? And have you actually done an ROI on this? Because ultimately, as a CFO, my personal experience is I want you to bring me the economic rationale for, especially in this environment, bring me the economic rationale for why you're doing this at the beginning. Because I don't want to get to the end of this and, and see all the bells and whistles and value props and then say well okay so what's the what are the economics of the deal oh well that's too late that. huge yeah, waste of that. time on that love it I think the so, internal piece yes so i'm going to ask everybody to expand on this and sarah great question right there in chat saying tell us more what information do we need to bring to the table so raleigh's gotten us started with show me the financial show me the roi calculations what else are we looking for Regina, let's go to you next on that. If you're getting involved, right, in a do we buy decision, what other information do you want brought to the table? So the thing that um, we discuss as a team, and it's really important that um, you're, you're not just selling to one person, depending on the size of your opportunity, you're, you're focusing on the priorities across the C-suite. I think that's important, and I, I want to put that out there. The questions that I'm constantly asking of our team is, What's it going to cost us to do this? What is my ROI multiplier? Like, not just don't just tell me I'm going to get ROI in six months or a year. Like, can I get 10x? Can I get, is it 3x? What's the multiplier for this? And even if it's not financial from a productivity perspective, because we are trying to do more with less as an organization. If you're being completely transparent, everyone is. And so how are you improving the efficiencies of the business, the productivity of the people or the bottom line? And to what multiplier can you do it? And in what time frame can you do it? So I'm constantly asking, what's it going to take for us to get there? What do we get out of it? And then what's the risk if we don't? What if we say no? Then, then what's it going to cost us if we don't do this? And so we just recently made some pretty big decisions here at Crayon in the U.S. Um, looking at, hey, if we don't do this, this is, I, I think, a, a bigger risk than we're willing to, to bite off. And so we need to make the decision, even though it was un unbudgeted, to proceed. And so that's what, what we're doing. Those are really great questions we should all come armed with. So that I, I just love it. Um, I want to let Steve and Celine answer that same question. And then uh, I've got another question right here in the chat. Steve, you're next, please. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly where 
we're I think we're all on the same page there. It's ultimately um, as you think about something that's not budgeted back to is it strategic? Is it going to lift the productivity? Does it make our sales force more effective? Does it make it does it help us from a whether it's cost of goods, whether it's cost of information, um, does it ultimately bring more information to the table that helps us to be more effective in terms of how we service a customer on the post sales or how we go to market on the uh, sales and marketing side? Wonderful. Celine, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a different perspective. So as a sales leader, I'm a P&L owner, so I own my budget for my IT spend. Um, and we've actually gone through an exercise, and I think there's probably a few people that work with me or for me on, on the webinar, but um, so they'll know this to be true. We've gone through an exercise looking at our spend, looking at the efficiency of our spend, readjusting budget. So I throw it out there as a real huge win for all of the sales guys on this call. You know, just because there's no budget, I think, um, Steve, you said it when we were offline about you know, if the budget's not available, that's not a no. You just have to give a compelling reason for somebody right. to use their budget in a different way. That's right. Find a compelling reason. And the best way to do that, um, if I look at my own personal journey that we've had over the last two or three months, um, we've sat and looked purely at ROI. What is the return on investment? Does it drive efficiency? We're a sales organization. We need to be efficient. We need to be accurate. We need to be effective. And so we've readjusted all of our tooling spend to accommodate that. We're actually in the middle of deploying three major vendors right now. So th there's so much opportunity out there. We just have to adjust how we look for it. Yeah, yeah can, that's sorry, Steve. Go ahead. I'll come after you. I was just going to tag on to that because as you think about the question, is it budgeted or not? Most companies nowadays are have a dynamic budgeting process. Or we call it a rolling plan uh, process where you have three months of actuals and nine months of forecast, six months of actuals and six months of forecast, right? Those are updates to your budget. And so to the point about that was just made in terms of um uh, is it is it if it's not budgeted, how do you reallocate? That's the discussion you want to have as a salesperson with your buying influence to say, well, you look, it's on your budget now, but how can we frame this and how can we get it in your next rolling plan update or your next update to the budget? Because that really does, you know, the world that we start that we're in today is different than it was January one. Yeah, I, I was going to echo that, which is as a leader, you have to trust your leaders. And so from my perspective, and I guess I should have qualified that, I don't really, and I hate this, the CFO office that's the no police. That's like, that's the antithesis to me. What I do is want to trust my leaders. Just, are you checking the boxes? But ultimately, Celine or Gina know what's better for her, for their departments than I do. That's so right. I don't, I'm not trying to second guess what they want to do. I want to super, like supercharge what they want to do. But I also have to check the boxes of like, okay, what's the money look like? What's the risk management piece? But my job is just to do that, not to try to second guess what their leadership strategy is. I've got two follow-up questions here. What's your minimum ROI multiplier? When somebody comes at you and says, this is great, you're going to get blank X ROI, right? When are you, are, is there a number where you're automatically like, meh? I mean, for my, I, sorry. No, 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 hit it. I, I was just going to say, for me, it's very much dependent on the tool because we have such a broad spectrum of tools, right? So, you know, if we're looking at a tool that's supporting forecasting, we're looking for accuracy, we're looking for uh, greater visibility into our business. So it's not necessarily an ROI when it comes to checks and balances. It, it, it will vary by tool. Everybody else echo that? Does anybody have a number that they'll share? I absolutely agree. So for example, if I'm going to invest in marketing dollars, I want a minimum of a 10x ROI. If I can get to 25x, I'm down. Let's go. Sign it. I don't care. I'll lean in. Um, but it, it also does depend on if we're talking about tools and customer experience um, drivers as well. Yeah. There are certain areas where you just decide, make a decision to invest, um, knowing that that ROI may be a break even or slightly lower than than what I, I would want from a marketing dollar, for example. Okay, good. Anybody else have some insight there? Yeah, I'd, look, I go back to, you know, as if you're selling software, you're selling SaaS based products as a company, that's your solution content. Um, you're ultimately looking from your perspective, you're thinking about what's 
as I sell my new customers, what's that lifetime value of a customer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what's it cost to get that customer? And so your LTV to CAC ratio, those are metrics that we're going to look for uh, from a uh, CFO's office. But when I'm buying something back, because now I'm buying an, a tool or, or something that's going to help my productivity, I'm looking for incremental growth to that LTV to CAC. And so it, it's not necessarily, there's not a firm number because it may not be a 10 X. It may be, it may just be marginal improvement of your LTV to CAC ratio, effectively reducing your cost of acquisition big by bringing new information to the table. But if you're impacting that key metric, that's huge. Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to go back to how you talked about, um, if budgeting doesn't just have to be annual, right? Can you give us the language to use for the non-financial folks like myself, right? I'm involved in a deal. People say, listen, we haven't budgeted for it. And I come back and say, yeah, but don't you see that rolling thing? That doesn't sound right. So how do we, how do we say that? Yeah, ultimately we call it a rolling plan update. Okay. And every quarter, so think about this, you're, you're marching through the year and, and we're all focused on the quarter. Some companies are focused on the month. It just depends on where they're at, but ultimately we're all focused on a quarter. And so your visibility um, in terms of your pipeline and all that, which feeds the top of the, you know, your sales and so forth, what you're going to close in December is a guess in January, right? I mean, you're, you're modeling, you're guessing based on your productivity, your funnel, your typical turn rates, but the, the fidelity of what's in that pipeline, what's going to happen on a quarterly basis becomes more and more real as you go throughout the year. And so that rolling plan update. So if you're pushing back on a, on a, uh, on a buyer of your products uh, or services or solution, you know, and it's not budgeted and that's kind of their stop sign, just come back to them and say, well, let's, let's figure out how we can one, look at what else you're spending on that we can potentially tweak and aggregate spend under us versus, you know, and eliminate some other vendors. Uh, and let's roll that into the rolling plan budget. Um, as you think about your rolling plan updates, um, uh, in the second half of the year versus say the first half of the year. I love it. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, I've got some really good follow-up questions here. Um, Allie, I'm coming back to yours, Karen, I promise, but Allie wants to know, um, talk to us about what questions you ask when you're evaluating the ROI, right? What holes are you trying to poke and what questions are you asking? How did you come up with these assumptions? Great. Mm -hmm. Big one. That's Everyone, just the start. Yeah. It's like a... <laughs> All right. And we can exactly. make some assumptions that are really, you know, beautiful to make, but I need to understand from a CFO perspective, I want to understand like, is there a reality in this? Mm -hmm. Is there a reality in it? Great. Who else? Um, yeah, I would say time to value as well, right, is a big consideration. Yeah. yeah, especially because obviously spend starts on day one. So you want to see how quickly it's going to take for you to get some value back out of it. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, oftentimes these ROIs that are presented from a, a seller to a buyer and in the buyer, depending on their level, is more sophisticated or less sophisticated. Make sure that if you're buying, if you're looking to get the CFO's approval to buy something, make sure that whatever the vendor is bringing to you, the supplier is mm -hmm. bringing to you is pertinent to your organization. Back to the back to Raleigh's point about um, what are, what's what are the assumptions don't talk to me about a hardware so a hardware manufacturing company if I'm a software company buying um, a CRM solution. Make sure it's apples to apples. Make sure it's it's in my language. And so for that, I would encourage you to do that that consultative sell approach if you're selling into those organizations. Be that consultative sell where you can can um, have some data points and information flow. Get sign the NDA. Get the NDA. But but talk use use the company's language when you're selling to them and formulating that ROI analysis versus just a gen, a generic ROI. Part of that also, throw up on we throw up on generic ROIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of that also, Steve, is understanding because you understand what your product is and and the impact on the business. The buying the buying the purchaser sometimes is going to have to think, okay, I'm going to buy this piece of software. But software doesn't just live in marketing. Anymore. It impacts your business systems. It impacts the sales teams. It might impact customer success. It might impact product. And so part of the process is coming to the table with a plan for implementation and change management. Yeah. And if you're selling into an organization and you have experience doing this, then, then it, before you get to the CFO's office, you may want to have that conversation about like who needs to be involved in this. Who are the other decision makers that need to be aware that this change is coming so that when it comes to Steve, 
you're like, Steve, this is this is what we want. This is the return that we see. This is how long it's going to take. This is who needs to be involved and who we the buy in. By the way, I've already spoken to these three people and we, we're going to need a project manager and this. Like that's a good way to start the conversation with the CFO. You've done all the legwork. Now we just can go, oh, you've thought about this. Okay, what else? Yeah. Wow. If, if I could just say, I, I would imagine, Steve, so keep me honest here, that even before you take it to your boss, you say, show me the math. And you want to make sure you have validated that math before you go to the CEO for a signature. Because yeah, that's exactly right. They will ask. <laughs> they will. And, and here's the deal. I go back to the, the way I framed. Think of your CFO's office, finance and accounting. Accounting looks back, finance looks forward as being that central intelligence agency. Because we look as we're thinking about the future, we're looking at those op operational metrics. And so to, whether it's change management, whether it's um, a new a productivity lift, all those have co inherent costs and benefits. So uh, to your point, let's make sure we've done the math. Let's make sure that um, knowing that I'm going to have to validate those numbers. And so if I can't validate them in my world, in my company, and, and I'm using a, a generic um, uh, component or assumption, it just doesn't hold water. You know, and, and Lauren, I gotta, I'm got i going to get on my soapbox about this, so forgive me. Step but, on up, girl. But if you're a seller and you you are trying to use your generic ROI, it will get thrown up on. We've established that. But I, one of the challenges that I see a lot of sellers um, encounter is they're afraid to ask, what, num what is the ROI you have to get out of this? And what numbers do you want me to use, Mr. Customer? Because I see a lot of people show up with their numbers and yep. then we end up hacking it to pieces. And so save yourself your sales cycle time and have this conversation very early in your discussions with your customer or your, your uh, prospect. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's really important because people are, seem to be afraid of the budget word and what kind of ROI and expectation the customer has. This is I where case that. studies become very important. Mm -hmm. Case studies that you can talk to a customer. If you're selling to a manufacturer or you're selling to a, another software company, speak their language by using another case study that way as a as a selling as a seller you can you can kind of prime the pump if you will in terms of some of those items but you don't know what's inside the four walls of your customer but prime them with a uh, this is what this is what a a, a like company look, focused on and this was their ROI let's figure out how this applies to your company mm -hmm. good good and it's a great way then to say well listen they achieved a 4x ROI within 90 days. Is this impressive in your company? Is this kind of ROI going to get the deal done in your company? How can I get these numbers from you? It's a great way to get what you're asking for and what you're, you're going to need, right? To Regina's point. Love it. All right. I'm going to ask another question. Karen, I'm coming back to yours. This is a good one. Um, so much of your advice is make sure you get the numbers, make sure you talk to the people ahead of time. How do we get those department heads? How do we get the use of the world to come to the sales meetings, because I'll tell you what you hear time and time again, uh, Regina and Celine, I bet you've heard this from your own staff sometime this week is, well, I can't go around her, right? I've been, I've been working with Heather this whole time and how, like she's, she's blocking it. I, how do I get to Celine if I'm working with Heather? So what's your advice? Let's start Celine with you first on this one, please. And then we'll hit yeah. Regina. I think it's a really, so the previous conversation is a really good segue into this. And I think, um, I, I think really good markets um, give buffer for poor sales process. So you get away with being a poor salesperson in a really strong market. In a really challenging market like we have today, you have to up your game from a sales perspective. And I liked what Regina said about budget. I asked the budget question early. There's two things that I, I've done a couple of um initiatives or, or uh, rollouts of, of new frameworks to try and up level an, a, our sales organization in terms of how they approach selling. And one of the things we looked at really was upfront contracting. It's kind of a bit of a buzzword that, that rocks about nowadays, but it's really about having all of the tough conversations upfront, like a conversation that says, if I'm going to sell to you, 
then I require you to have these people involved in this process. We're required to have a really blunt, open conversation about budget and timelines and all of the things that end up where we get, you know, how many times have we heard, I'm being ghosted, I can't get a hold of these, they're totally silent for the last two weeks. You know, if we give, if we, what we have to do is get out ahead of it, set out a sales process that is agreed with the with the organization we're trying to sell to, then it becomes a very open, fluid um, process. Nobody feels a need to hide information. You know, I always say, just because you didn't ask the question, that doesn't change the answer, right? So if you're going to go in here and we're going to get to the end of it, and then you're going to say, hey, I need my CFO sign off, and we've just gone through a whole sales process, then it gets to Steve and Steve says, hey, your math doesn't stack up, get out the door. We have to address all of these things up front. And we've kind of tagged that as upfront contracting to say, this is what our sales process looks like. This is what we're going to require of you as a potential customer of ours to go through. And actually, believe it or not, as a, as a potential buyer, they really appreciate the guide, the, those guardrails to the process. And so they really engage in it and they can call out upfront if they're going to have a challenge getting people involved in that process. So it's it, it's, it's a very um, positive way to approach it, I would say. Plus you don't waste time. There's also actually a, some studies about that. I'll get the numbers completely wrong, but Gong did a study that said more deals close when you discuss the full sales process in call one. Mm. So I, I just love that. Regina, what do you want to add? I, I, I just would only echo what Celine had okay. to say. I, I think that, you know, that in my head, I'm always thinking ABC always be closing. Yes, it's not for the, the order, but for that next step, you, you earn the right every time you engage with a customer to get them to re-engage. And so if they're not engaging, my question is, what expectation did you set at the end of that last meeting? So let me ask a question. Is this different when we're outbounding to them, right? So sure, when somebody really wants to buy my stuff, it feels a little easier for me to be like, hey, let me tell you how we work, uh, right? And I'm really going to need your XYZ leaders involved in our second call. And we want to involve your CFO or finance folks and call three or four. And then at the end, we do this and da, da, da. But when I've outbounded to them on a lead list and they don't even know that they need me yet, does that change the conversation? I think it might change the way you approach the conversation, but the reality goes back to what I said. If you don't ask the question, it doesn't change the answer. You just don't know what the answer is. Um, and so it, it it shifts the dynamic. I think in, in the early stages of an outbound opportunity, you're really trying to establish if there's an actual opportunity here. And that's what I mean by just because you don't answer, ask the question. If there is a genuine opportunity to sell, they will engage in a process, a very structured process, irrespective of whether it's inbound or outbound, because there's lots of outbound opportunities where it was just opportunistic that you landed at the right time, in the right place at the right time. You know, I was thinking when Steve was talking about the rolling budgets, a lot of organizations that you talk to will be locked into 12 month contracts or they've got six months left or so you're really outbound is 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 getting in line with their <clears throat> the linearity of their budget right so at that point absolutely why would you why would you not right and again what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop wasting time for ourselves for a potential customer and um, for all of the teams and organizations that sit around those two individuals. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I would say absolutely. Can I get perspective as a marketing lead for this? I know that we're not marketing Please. here, but we put are. Put on that hat now, Raleigh. Let me put that one on. So many of the organizations on this call, probably the marketing organizations have invested significant sums to get intent data so that they can market to the right person at the right time with the right message and also see who in the organization is actually interested in your product or who's potentially been investigating it. And if you're B2B, I just go back there. If you're B2B and you can see, and Steve, you're SaaS, so I know you I probably name every system in your marketing stack. Like you can see who's interested, who's crawling on your website, who's doing, who's doing what. 
So even in an outbound sales motion, engage with your marketing organization and say, tell me what you have. Because a lot of times the BDRs really don't know what's there. They're not getting the right training. Make sure they understand how to what it is, how to use it, and then work with them. Say, this is what I need. This is what I want. And so if you could build those lead lists using some of the marketing technology that's out there, which is pretty incredible, you can have an outbound program where you actually are making closer to a warm call than a cold call because you know what they're interested, what they've been looking at. You may even know some of the keywords that they've been utilizing. And if you can build your first outreach with something like that, all of a sudden your that email is talk, is using language that, that they are using across the digital footprint that they don't even, that they don't even know you know. Mm -hmm. That increases your likelihood of a response. And if you can do that, that gets the opening the, for the phone call where you start to have that consultative sales experience that really drives the numbers. Okay, well, you've opened us up to the next wonderful question in here from Melina. What's the best way when outbounding, SDRs are outbounding to y'all, right? To the C-level. What makes you take a call? <laughs> the smile says nothing. I will never get on the call. Well, I'm I'm happy to chime in here. Um, and I kind of don't want to give up my secret because I'm afraid I might get inundated now. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has to promise right now. But truth right serum, now. truth serum. Okay. Um, I am inundated every day in LinkedIn, in email my cell phone how many of you see the potential spam thing kicking up like Five, ten I'm never gonna that. pick that up I'm just gonna shoot straight I have responded when when the business is in a place of looking for or searching for something that someone is selling if that seller has reached out to me over the, an extended period of time or a year I actually bookmark some of those in my LinkedIn. There's a guy right now who sent me some information. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. And then, but he was persistent like seven times. And it wasn't all in a week or 28 days. And sending me pertinent information that was useful or to educate me. Did I read it? No. But the fact that the guy stuck around and was persistent is an indicator to me the guy's going to stick around. And he's persistent enough to earn and win my business when I'm going to need him. And so that built a, a strange amount of trust in my mind. It's the same with people who leave voicemails and say, I'm going to call you Friday at 9 a.m. If you're not able to meet, that's fine. Can you let me know when is a good time to meet? And then calls me Friday at 9. Now, am I going to pick up the phone? No, nope, maybe not. Let's go to voicemail again. Because I'm, I'm giving him the seven test, the, the laws of seven. Wow my rule of seven. And then I know this guy's worth his salt and he's going to follow up when he says he's going to follow up. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And that's who I want to buy from. And if it's no, it, I'm telling you, there's 130 people on this call and I'm willing to bet you two of them do that practice. And so it's pretty easy to ignore everything because I'm pretty confident that 128 of you won't follow up and follow through like that guy. And that's the people I want to buy from. That was gold. Absolute gold. Does anybody else have a rule like this they can share? I can tell you it's, in, it's running a large, large organization for a U.S. part of this global company all the time. And I didn't look at any of that stuff. But what the, the things that caught my eye, so I don't even have a, an office phone. So there's no way to call me directly. The things that catch my eye, an email that addresses a something that I need fixed that understands my business and the tools that I'm using. Mm -hmm. So it's work. You're going to have to figure out what's in the market since what's in the marketing technology stack. What are the things there? Like a year ago, it was like AI and ML and website optimization and millions of emails. The one that caught my eye was the one that knew what the tools were that I was using and what the general challenges were with that tools and, and told me very clearly and concisely how I could address that. Mm. And then I noticed it. And then I don't make do anything at that point. I go send it out to this other guy and I go, hey, can you check this out and tell me if this how this would work with our system? 
So now you've got a different person coming into your ecosystem from your prospect client that's doing the research, even though the CMO, the CFO or the CMO is the one who you're doing the outreach to, because we just don't have time to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's not a bad thing to be passed down in the organization. It's a great thing. That's the only way it's going to happen. Right, right, Steve? That's exactly right. The best thing you can do is to be passed down from a C-suite. Uh-huh. So it's worth your time. But I like that. Um, Listen, I get so many that are like, hey, as a coach, why don't you? I'm like, I'm not a coach. I like don't. So if you're going to assume you know somebody's business, don't F it up. Like, actually, you've got to be right about it. I've heard somebody else give great advice, too, that says, know my business, but don't tell me my business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it might be smarter to instead, I know it, and then ask a really smart question in there right or i see that you're using x y and z tool here are some things that i've seen does this pertain to you right is this valuable for you instead of because you're using this i know that you're having these problems there's a fine line there isn't there here's a little thing that will that just totally drives me crazy and it's so easy to do if you say you're going to do something do it do it when you said you're going to do it and do it better than you told me you're going to do it but do not Tell me that you're going to send me something on a Thursday and it comes to me on Friday and it's not what you told me you were going to send. Like, I will never speak to you again because that tells me that my business isn't important to you. Mm -hmm. So, folks, there's another there's an advanced tip in here. Sure, there's follow up and do what you say you're going to do. But the advanced tip is make something up that you're going to do just so you can show you're going to do it. (laughs) Right. If there's follow up information to send. It's not, yeah, you know, I'll get that to you. It's, I will get that to you and it will come over Friday at 9 a.m. No, it, 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 it's, it's arbitrary, sure, but it, sh- it gives you a chance to be that hero, right? You're going to call back. Again, I will call you back Friday at 9 a.m. Find excuses to demonstrate your follow through. I think that's really cool. Could I, I share a little um, uh, piece of um, uh Uh, data that we found right so we all know outbound is a very heavy lift right it 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 takes a lot and most of the reason for that and and Europeans tend to much prefer very passive approach right so a very direct approach tends to be yeah we, we don't really dig that we'd much rather kind of content share and thought leadership share and that kind of thing um and and so when you do outbound we we found we measured actually of our inbound new business, 70% of it, no word of a lie, 70% of it had had a BDR outreach in the previous 12 to 18 months. Now, what's interesting about that, and the reason why I say it is that feels like a very long play, but you have to be very careful about your outreach, that it's a very positive interaction that you're having with that potential client. Because what you want, you you know, in the main, and we've we've said it, and um, Rowley mentioned it earlier in a, using um, technology to be able to anticipate, you know, the where they sit in the buying process, and so that you you make your outreach a bit more effective. At some point, that individual is going to drop into the buying process. They're going to drive it, drive into ready to purchase. And you want the experience that you've had previously with them to be a really positive experience, whether it's what Regina said, following up, even if they come back and say, hey, love it, not right now, but I'll keep you in mind for when we rock around. 70% of all inbound new business had a previous outreach by a BDR. That's how I, I believe that's the true value of our BDR organizations. That's where they drive true value. Bingo. So um, I just want to echo on this because the vast majority of BDRs that we see making outbound calls do not leave messages. So understand that it's a branding touch. Okay. A voicemail, you may not want to listen to it and they may not listen to it, but it doesn't count unless you're leaving a message. And by the way, calling without adding value actually will take them out of your sales cycle, right? Don't bully me. And don't bump me in top of box and don't touch my base like that. You're not actually don't touch anything. You're not helping yourselves here. So it, it's almost this rule of, yeah, go do it. We all have to play the game. Seven's the minimum number of touches, but don't make a Mickey because you're literally devaluing the brand Absolutely. Absolutely. as you do that. All right. So I want to hear, I, I'm going to do a quick round Robin on 
top mistake sellers make? Mm. Go when you're ready. Top mistake. I think not having, um, well, if provided we're in a sales process or at the start of it, I think not getting that or setting out those parameters at the start is the biggest mistake. Okay. Going in, being afraid to ask the, the hard questions at the start, uh, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a clear pathway to failure. Thank you for that. I'm really glad you brought that back around. I'm going to echo that um, and double click on it and just also say, don't be afraid. Those tough questions really are about qualifying the customer and allowing them to qualify you and the quality and the credibility that you're going to build with them by, be, by being bold enough and brave enough to asking the appropriate questions that are tough. And so um, to me, when people do that, it increases your credibility and I'm willing to keep the conversation moving forward. All right, so let's go. I'm going to go on a limb. People skip it. I see a lot of people skip the tough oh. questions. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go on a limb here, and I'm just going to make something up and have you coach me. All right. I'm the rep, and right, y'all are. We're on this first call together, and I say, listen. Um, before we get any further, I want to make sure that I'm not wasting your time, and you're not wasting my time. We're all really busy people. So, can we talk a little bit about the buying process and the budget? Are you all right if we dive into that for a few minutes? Cool. Anything you'd change about that? All right. Take that. Make it your own, everybody. Then we go right in and say our typical solutions, right? Here's a budget time frame. Is this budgeted already? Here's the range. Do you have budget for this yet? What's it look like? How difficult is it to get budget? Exactly. Then that dovetails nicely into, all right, and who gets involved in that? Can you help me map it out every single step of this buying process? Yeah. And you might, you might add on that part of it, the tertiary uh, solutions, right. That where you can aggregate spend and, and become, you know, as a, if you're trying to sell something and you're competing with point solutions, figure out how you can create a more um, consolidated approach. It's going to take longer, but it's back to that, that multiple touch, multiple um, consultative uh, discussions with the customers and, and maybe multiple departments to build that trust back to the customer, truly qualifying it. Um, they may only take they may only take a part of what you're selling uh, in the end of the day, but at least you you've created a, a bigger, more strategic story um, that they can uh, walk before they run with you on. OK, so what I think Steve is saying here, folks, I'm going to translate it um, right. You've got a really wide product set. And so you're saying right up from the beginning, listen, most of the departments who love working with us are. I'm often involved with this department, this department, this department, this department, this department. Right. How do we get them involved in looking at the solution? Does that work? Can you coach that? All right. All right. Uh, I'll add something there. <clears throat> or, right. uh, it's Good. today's environment, especially because I mean, if you're PE owned or even if you're not, the, the, the compression is on cost. Mm -hmm. And so you better come with a very concise, clear differentiation compared to your competitors mm -hmm. for when you, when you show up. And it's got to be something right at the beginning because nobody is going to make a change just because right. so, be so before you go down this path of what's the budget and who's the who, do you have the authority make sure that there's a need there and make sure you understand what those pain triggers and benefits are for that specific customer and how your product is going to do a better job than anything else that they have or at least be able to try to do that because in today's environment if you don't have that there it you might as not, not might as well not go forward because and it's not going to be worth somebody to, to have that discussion with you. I'm not going to answer your hard questions if I'm not that interested. So right. you talked about pain and triggers. Steve, before you talked about FUD, can you tell everybody what that stands for? Well, you got to, at times you've got to kind of uh, create the fear, uncertainty and doubt, right? In terms of um, uh, what you're, what you're selling, why you're selling it, why they should be considering it um, in a recessionary market, you know, Figure out what's maybe it's hiring, maybe it's labor shortages, maybe it's uh, supply chain risk. Who knows what the FUD is? But but figure out how to take that FUD factor and and um, build it into your your uh, storyboard with your with your uh, sales team. I also want to say that in the end of the day, you know, hopefully nobody's on this call is thinking that they're going to call straight into a C suite and and have a cold call. 
all these all this discussion around case studies and ROIs and, and assumptions and kind of preparing is done at the lower levels where you're you're building your storyboard, right? If it's a and it really is a function of how big your transaction is. If you're selling a million dollar transaction, you've got a lot of work to be done at the lower levels before it ever gets to the C-suite. If you're selling a a uh, 25k solution or less, you know that that's probably not something the C-suite's going to spend a ton of time on. Um, but still, prepare your buying influence so that if they have to go, if they do have to escalate, that they've got that you know that uh, Cliff Notes version of that of that business case. Really good final advice. Thank you so much for that. I want to share with everybody there are is a wonderful download with a lot of these tips, factory.com forward slash CFO. Also, folks, if you're looking for more training on this, we've got some great stuff to help you really build that value and a deeper dive into business. <clears throat> we find that reps, the young, the, the younger reps who are starting with us may not have that real knowledge of what a CRO is looking for versus a CFO, et cetera. So we have put together a training course for this, factor8.com forward slash exec. All right. I want to give you guys a chance to give out some, yeah, tell us what's going on with you and uh, how people can interact with you. Regina, what are we looking at here for you? We are hiring sellers in a client director position. So think of them as a quarterback of the account for um, calling on the C-suite, of course, in technology, finance, and across multiple industries. And we also have a sales director position open for the East. So the whole Eastern Seaboard, there is a sales manager position that we have opened up just yesterday, and we'll be reporting to a fabulous VP of the East who just recently joined us. And so if you like to have fun, and if you like to be um, consultative in your sales approach, look us up on and, LinkedIn. And if you like to work for incredibly strong leaders, right, go, go to Regina's team. All right, Celine, what's mm -hmm. happening with a hot jar? Yeah, I mean, we're similar. We're hiring across the board. We're hiring um, in partnerships, all direct sales everywhere in all regions as well. So if you are in Europe, we're also hiring in Europe as well as the Americas. But yeah, and, and the best way, I think, is to go to our careers page. We have a wonderful careers page. We're very transparent um, employer. So you'll see all of the salary ranges and, and job descriptions associated. And listen, if you're looking for some of that customer intent data that Raleigh was talking about, that's exactly what Hotjar does. So another reason to check out Hotjar. Steve, tell us about HSI. Look, HSI, we're, we focus on compliance related solutions and um, productivity of employees. A safe, a, a, an engaged workforce is a safe workforce. And so as, if we're the Netflix of safety, if you will, uh, and we have the software solutions to, to um, track and report uh, for compliance reasons, um, we also have the solutions that allow uh, for an engaged uh, workforce um, through productivity and, and uh, engagement, professional skills types of development. All that said, we all we're always hiring, right? Good good sales folks. If you're you know if you've got the uh, the pedigree and you've got the proven experience, apply because as as uh, you know as recessionary FUD looms or as the market uh, continues to focus, we focus on our performers, and you're always looking at the lower performers to try to replace them with with uh, top tier performers. So um, look at our look at our website, uh, apply. We are always hiring. Thank you for that. Fantastic. And Raleigh, you've done all of the C positions and you're looking for your next one. Looking for the next one. So, yeah, if, you, if anybody needs somebody to help them come in there that understands from the CFO's office, from the chief administrative CMO, CRO, I come in and build a really strong granular data and analytical framework that'll help you drive your pipeline and scale and grow your business. Let me know. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Good, good, good. All right. Everybody's profiles are in the chat. We thank you all for joining us. Um, panel, let me just do this for everybody in the audience right now. You guys were fantastic. This was wonderful. Appreciate you so much. And we can't wait to see you next time at our Factor 8 sales shot. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Keith. Lauren. Great work, everybody. Thanks, LB. It was fun. Take care. Thank Bye, you guys. so much.